Hi folks, welcome back. On the last lecture we talked about style from a rhetorical perspective. We talked about how making a good sentence or a good paragraph is similar to making good gourmet dishes. There's a lot of different factors to consider. In this part of the lecture we'll focus in on word choice and vocabulary, the building blocks of sentences and paragraphs, really the, the atomic elements that we have to work with. Now, you ever wondered, how do you know what's a good word to use in a sentence versus another one? There are really four uh, things to look for. And we'll talk about each one, but just briefly, here's an overview. What does the word mean, the meaning of the word? Two, familiarity. If, will the intended readers know this word? Will they be familiar with it? Uh, the strength of the word. Is it a little over the top, or maybe it's not emphatic enough? And then, the sound of the word. Believe it or not, the way that words sound when you when they're read aloud makes a big difference. Even if it's just a document that you know will only be read silently, if it sounds good when it's read aloud, it will almost automatically be easier to follow and be more enjoyable for the reader. Okay, the first uh, criteria to talk about then is meaning, and these are easy to ascertain. You can just look in the dictionary. Uh, the problem is. Uh, if you use the thesaurus, which is built into Microsoft Word, it's, uh, I believe, Shift F5 or Shift F6, you get a list of synonyms. The problem is that the thesaurus doesn't really dis distinguish between these words. There's no such thing as uh, exact synonyms. So, uh, for example, the soldier, blank, the enemy mortar team. If I just look in a thesaurus, it might say murdered, executed, put down, bumped off, dispatched, assassinated, killed. I mean, those words all have something to do with the concept, uh, but they're very different meanings there. So I had to make sure I picked the right one. Uh, so for example, in this one, uh, I would want to say something like the soldier dispatched, or the soldiers killed the enemy mortar team. Uh, murder is definitely wouldn't be appropriate because it's not a crime for soldiers to kill enemy soldiers. That's <laughs> what they do. A uh, second example, the teacher is it educated the students, tutored the students, lectured the students, coached or trained. Again, uh, the, the, just because they're together in the thesaurus doesn't mean they all mean the exact same thing. So there, it'd probably make more sense to say the teacher lectured the students, or maybe the teacher uh, tutored. Actually, tutoring wouldn't make sense, right? Because a teacher and a tutor are a little different occupations. So uh, probably in that example, I would say uh, lectured. Okay, now we get into denotation and connotation. Now the denotation, with the D, denotation, that is the what's in the dictionary. So if you look the word up in the dictionary, you got the definition there. That's what it supposedly officially means according to Webster or Oxford or whoever. Uh, then we have the connotation. And that is the way the word is actually used amongst a, a given audience, right? So. It, you might look the word up in the dictionary, maybe it's not even in the dictionary, but people are still using it. Or maybe the way people use it is very different than the definition that you see there. So a good example of this is how words change in their uh, connotations, right? So uh, the word gay, formerly, not too long ago, uh, if you saw that word, would you just think that meant happy. Uh, the children have been happy and gay this morning. Nobody would have thought there was anything uh, sexual about that. Uh, however, we know now that the word gay uh, is sort of synonymous with homosexuals or uh, same-sex relationships. You know, there's all kinds of different words that mean this, but it's sort of, uh, there's no way to use the word gay nowadays without people assuming you're talking about sexuality. So it's something to be aware of. You might have unintentional humor. Uh, the company needs a manly sales force. Uh, well, there we have a word, manly. It used to just be a compliment, sort of a positive thing. Uh, now, though, people would look at that and think it's kind of a sexist uh, usage there to use that. So you'd want to say something like the company needs a strong sales force or an aggressive sales force. But <laughs> stay away from manly or a womanly, womanish, you know, unless you're using those words appropriately. And then the Merry Christmas, Santa ejaculated. Uh, kids, I remember back in uh, grade school, even at that early of an age, uh, fourth or fifth grade or so, uh, some of our readings would have the word ejaculate in there and always some of the kids would you know giggle a little bit at this and then the teacher would say I don't you know, I'm so embarrassed you shouldn't be laughing at that uh, <laughs> you know, and it's just uh, 
it's just the word has a sexual connotation to it. So, again, just because the definition in the dictionary seems like it's a great choice doesn't mean that it is. You need to be aware of this connotation as well. And this can be a big issue for students who learn English uh, from a book or from taking classes because uh, it takes some time. You have to spend some time in a culture before you can start picking up on these connotations and know uh, people don't usually use that word in that context. All right, so here's just a way to sum this up. So the thesaurus will give you all the possible synonyms, but you should never just use that. You should also look at the definitions of the words, too. Uh, make sure the definitions work. And also, if possible, I think about the connotations. I like to go to Google and type in the word, uh, get the definition first, and then see if I can find some pages out there where people are using it, and then look at how it's being used and what context. So now we uh, get to familiarity. Are you familiar with the word? That's nice. But what about the reader? Does the reader know the definition of the word? Uh, maybe not. Maybe that's, uh, that's okay. Uh, you can just explain what the word means. But probably makes more sense to use words that the readers will be familiar with. Uh, so here's an example, number one. Uh, the classroom regulars reveled in the proactive educationalist. Uh, this is somebody that's got uh, thesaurus area, if you will. They've just gone to the thesaurus and plugged in fancy words for everything. Makes a lot more sense just to say it clearly. The students like the upbeat teacher. Now, how can you expand your vocabulary? Now, there's been a lot of money made uh, with courses and books and probably even uh, medications and specialties or whatever. Uh, they're supposed to help you expand this vocabulary, but really there's only one method that to me really works. And that is if you hear a word you don't know, take the time uh, to write it down, look it up in the dictionary, uh, think about how it was used in the sentence, and then uh, after you've done this, and oh, by the way, learn how to pronounce it. Uh, I just want to stop there for one second because uh, the internet has made this so easy. It used to be a big pain if you didn't know how to pronounce a word. You had to look it up and then you had to figure out how to use this weird sort of symbolic uh, system of pronunciation. And now there's most of the online dictionaries will actually just say the word so you can listen and hear how it's said. It's very, very nice. Um, okay, so you got the definition, you know how it's uh, pronounced. Uh, then you need to start really fixating on the word. Just let it, you know, think about it. Repeat it to yourself a few times. Come up with a few different uh, sentences that use it. And then uh, after you're more comfortable with this, you can try to use it yourself in a conversation or a paper. That really makes a lot of sense. I'll also give you a tip here. Uh, easy way, almost a cheating kind of way to make better grades in your classes that have writing is to listen to the professor's lecture. If you hear the professor use a word, uh, some technical words, maybe you don't know what they mean, always write those down. Uh, but if there's just certain words that the professor seems to like, you know, if uh, he or she sort of smiles a little bit or warms up a little bit when they use that word, uh, sort of underline that <laughs> word or phrase. And then uh, when you write a paper, try to use all these words and phrases in your writing. I don't know how it works exactly, but almost magically you'll see those grades uh, start to shoot up if you do that. So pay attention to these uh, lectures. Okay, now we get to buzzwords. Uh, these are words that people use and it's kind of fun to use them, but uh, they really can make it, your writing seem ridiculous if you use them badly. And some people just get irritated by the buzzwords. So you have to sort of uh, think about the audience. Uh, so, for example, number one, my seamless brain flow will solutionize your operationalization. You know, as somebody that's trying to sound uh, really fancy again, uh, I think we can uh, just get rid of the buzzwords, though. Uh, number two, we're drinking the Google juice here and really synergizing big time. But we need absolute reciprocal options and a balanced transitional interface. <laughs> so, I have no idea what the sentence means. I just generated it with one of those online... Uh, buzzword tools, it's kind of fun to play around with those, but you're really not saying anything useful here, so just stick to the regular vocabulary. Okay, now we get to word strength. And you have to think about the what you're trying to say and how much emotional force you want to have behind it. So, for example, you won, exclamation point, versus you were successful. The shorter expressions typically have a little bit more punch. You won. Seems a little bit more forceful somehow than you were successful. So if you want to say something very strongly, very emphatically, keep it short. Uh, keep the words short. 
Now, if you want to make it weaker, though, you can start using the longer words, and you can put things like not, un, in front of it. So, for example, your body weight is normal for your height versus your weight is not unusual for your height. So you can hear a little bit of difference there. Uh, your body weight is normal for your height. Your weight is not unusual for your height. So that second one seems a little weaker. Like, you know, maybe there is something to be concerned about there. Uh, whereas the first one, there's nothing to be concerned about. So which of these would you rather be? One, not unattractive. B, attractive. Or C, beautiful. I think I know which one I would rather be. Okay, now that brings us to repetition. So usually repetition is a bad idea. Uh, you don't want to use the same word over and over again. It just makes it irritating, but it can also make something more um, amplified or louder. And I heard a journalist uh, one time say that uh, the rule they had a, at uh, his newspaper was you take a ruler and if you could uh, connect two words by less than an inch, you know, the same word, uh, twice you had to use another word, <laughs> had to structure your sentences differently. You know, I don't know about that, but it is a good idea to think about how you're repeating words. So here's a repetition done well. This is by um, Anais Nin, and she's repeating the word writing. If you do not breathe through writing, if you do not cry out in writing, or sing in writing, then don't write, because our culture has no use for it. <laughs> a pretty strong statement there, but you'll notice, even though she says the word writing uh, several times in this sentence, it works. It just makes it a little more powerful because she's amp using it for amplification. It's not that she doesn't know other words for writing, it's just that she's doing this for effect. Now then we get to repetition done badly. And so compare this example. Effective communication takes time to learn. However, Effectively communicating is critical for job advancement in almost every field, not just those associated with communication skills. Therefore, you should always strive to make your communication skills more effective. <laughs> this really seems like a stunted vocabulary. It's like, how many times can I say effective communication in a sentence? So you really want to rethink this, maybe use some pronouns, uh, find some different ways to structure the sentences, or maybe I'll look some <laughs> words up in the thesaurus. Okay, lastly, we have the sound of the words. Now, always think like a poet. Even though you're not writing in verse, you want to pay attention to the way things sound as well as what they mean. Make a big difference in the reception. So, do you have the right number of syllables? Is this going to sound well when you read it out loud? Will it be a tongue twister? We get sort of tongue tied, we run out of breath. All of these signs are uh, that you need to do something with the word sound. And also, some words just sound harsher than others, and you want to be wary of that as well. So let's look at the three examples here. Um, I went to a website and looked for the most unpleasant sounding words in the English language. <laughs> I found a nice little list of them, so I've tried to pack these sentences full. I'll let you guess uh, which of the words were on the list. Uh, so number one, her double was indubitably dubious of the dub. <laughs> Obvious tongue twister. Uh, two. You should extirpate the moist nugget from the batch. Then my favorite, number three, a large new repository would rectify our condition. <laughs> uh, so you have to be pretty, uh, pretty tone deaf, I think, not to say there's a little something, a little something uh, funky with those word choices there. Might want to rethink some of those. Um, now, carrying on with the poetry, there's a technique called alliteration, uh, which is uh, repeating the uh, first syllables of the word, so the clatter of the classroom. And then we have assonance, which is repeating the uh, second part of the word, the verb sounds. Uh, so I don't agree with police either. Uh, that's m, m So you can hear, I don't agree with police either. So it sounds kind of neat when you write sentences like that. Um, and then you just want to be careful with uh, mixing the formal and informal words. This is why you don't just need to know the definition. You need to know where do these words commonly appear together. If you read a lot of academic writing, uh, you'll notice that there's certain terms that are associated together. You see them together quite often. Uh, but in a novel, it would be really unusual to see those words. And well, same thing with you know, any kind of writing. There's going to be words that are acceptable and familiar to that uh, context for those readers. And then other kinds that will just seem uh, weird or humorous that you put it in. 
So for example, juxtaposing the two compound sentences, Smith abruptly recognized their suckiness. <laughs> so you wouldn't see the word sucky. Uh, it sounds really strange to have that word in the same sentence with words like juxtaposing, a compound sentence, abruptly, uh, recognized. You know, those are all sort of writerly academic words, and suckiness is just something you would hear out on the street, so uh, be wary of that. All right, so hopefully these are some good tips for improving your vocabulary and using words more effectively. Uh, just to uh, sum up here, uh, the best way to expand your vocabulary, just listen uh, to your professor's lecturing. If you have reading assignments, uh, look out for words that you don't know the meaning of. Figure out what they mean and how to pronounce them uh, by writing them down. Uh, but also think about the context that it was used in. It's very important. It'll save you a lot of embarrassment and trouble later. Anyway, uh, thank you for listening, and uh, next time we'll talk about sentences.